Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it. We thank you. It's being written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. Thank you for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're going to be talking to you today about the subject of understanding true repentance. Very important subject is if we're going to conquer sin, we certainly have to have true repentance in our life. We begin in Hebrews 6, 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ. The first one listed is repentance from dead works. When we talk about repentance, this is a word which means a change of mind. You see this in the lower window as we have information down below that, that pops up and we put a cursor over the particular word. So it means a change of mind. If we really have a change of mind, it's going to be shown by a change of action, by we're going to be doing the things that God would have us to do and not the things that he would not have us to do. In this case, repentance from dead works. We would turn away from all dead works in our life. The Hebrew word also means a change of mind or a change of heart. We have a change of purpose, and it also is emphasizing, again, the change of conduct, the change of your action shown by your walk and the things that you do. We begin back in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, we look in verse 5. This is where God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. In every imagination, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, what was the thought that the Lord had because of that? It repented that the Lord, that he'd made man on the earth and grieved him in his heart. He was sorry that he had made it. Man on the earth because of the wickedness that he'd come to the place of. So he said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. He was sorry that he had made man because man was walking in wickedness continually. Of course, one man, though, found grace in the sight of the Lord, which was Noah. He was preserved as the flood came and destroyed them all except for Noah and his family. We see in Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest up of the land of Egypt corrupted themselves. Uh, they were doing evil. And so he goes down there and says, They turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto, declaring that they were these gods, O Israel, that he brought up out of the land of Egypt. He said, I've seen these people, that it's a stiff-necked people. Therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them. I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. He was ready to get rid of the whole group. Well, we come down to verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil that he thought to do. And this is because of the fact that Moses had come and said, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I've spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. He reminded him of his covenant, and God changed his mind of the evil that he thought to do unto his people because of their evil. When we walk in sin, judgments will certainly come. But if we turn and repent, then God is a merciful God, and he brought up the fact that he had a covenant with man and that he would, was to obey that covenant and carry it out. God repented of the evil that he thought to do. Quite a statement. We come to Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 8. Speaking about a nation. If that nation against whom I have pronounced, when he's pronounced judgments against him, if he'll turn from their evil, I will repent change my mind of the evil that I thought to do unto them. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build and to plant? If they do evil in my sight, that obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Otherwise, God might have blessings that he wants, says he's going to bring, but if they don't walk in the, his ways, he's not going to bring those. He's going to change his mind from those things. Otherwise, God will change his mind depending upon what people do. 
we see, or what a nation does in this case. In Jeremiah chapter 26, we see over in verse 3, If so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent of me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them, because of their evil their doings. You know, God does things, brings judgment because of what the people have done. They've done evil. Now shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If you will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not hearkened. They wouldn't listen. So what was going to happen? Judgments, of course, were going to come. We come down to verse 13, and he says, Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he pronounced against you. Again, God is just. If we, if we will turn from evil ways, then God will turn from judgments that have been pronounced against us. We come down to verse 19. Here he says, Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him all to all, at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord? And the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them. Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. God, again, will change if we meet conditions. Here's a case where there was a change. Jonah chapter 3. Nineveh was a very evil place. And in verse 4, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, the people of Nineveh, they, they hearkened to and believed the word that was spoken. It says they believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. The word came unto the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne. He laid his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth, sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, neither let, ne let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. They couldn't even drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every way from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. It was a very violent place. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. If we will meet God's conditions, judgments will not come upon us. God delights in mercy not in judgment. But at the same time, he's a just God. If we walk in the ways of sin, judgments will come upon us. Now, true repentance has to be truly from the heart. We see over in Joel, chapter 2, verse 13. He said, Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil if they would tear or turn their heart towards God. God's looking at our heart, because our heart is where the real motivation comes from. Of course, they were always saying that they were repenting. You know, I've heard people over the years tell me how many times they've repented, they repented, they repented, they repented. They never repented, shown by their works and by their action. Now look at the statement made in Jeremiah 15, 6. He says, Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord, thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. Their so-called repenting, which truly wasn't repenting. <laughs> they say they repent, but they continue to do their evil things. Well, now destruction is going to come. God is a very long-suffering God and very merciful. But if we continue, surely judgments are going to come. We see in, Ex in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. God's not going to allow idols in anybody's life. An idol is anything that's a source other than God. He needs to be your total source. You have an idol of anything. It could be money. It could be things. It could be a job. It could be a person. It could be something that you look to as a source in your life. We cannot have idols. When he has idols, then 
certainly judgments will come if we don't come to the place of repentance. We see in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity should not be your ruin. That shows you sin will bring your ruin. What's the wages of sin? It's death. And we saw all the effects of sin when we talked about it. Tremendous judgments will come on people because of their evil ways that they continue in. We see over in Jeremiah, Certainly, there is going to be a judgment coming to the church, remember. And the church has got to get right if they are going to see God's mercy and they're going to see God accomplish what He wants for them. Jeremiah 8, 6, I've hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. They went their own way. What have I done? You know, try to think that they're an innocent one. No. If we are have sin in our life, we must come in line with what he says. They didn't speak right. They didn't repent and turn away from the things that they had in their life. You certainly aren't going to fool God, and we're not going to get away with the things that we've been doing. We must have true repentance in our life. Jeremiah 31, verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. He didn't like the chastisement that was coming upon him. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, even confounded, because I did, did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I surely will have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. That shows you that God is a God of mercy. He delights in mercy, not in judgment, if we will meet the conditions. We come over to the New Testament, and we see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, John the Baptist going forth preaching. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent! Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when he says repent here, this means again, change your mind, and mend your ways. And this wasn't just for a moment. This is a present tense verb, meaning continually have this change in your life. Repentance has got to be ongoing effect, not just for a moment, and then go back to our evil ways. That's not true repentance. And this is a command. Imperative mood command. Everyone is to repent and turn away from the things that were contrary to the word of God. Well, come to verse 6. They went out to Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region about Jordan. And verse 6, it says they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And of course, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Otherwise, the judgments that were going to be coming. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. That tells us something very important. If we really true have, truly have repentance, it'll be shown by fruit. Fruit doesn't come just because I put the seed in the ground and all of a sudden it's suddenly the fruit. No, fruit comes because that seed grows and produces that fruit from ongoing continual work of growth. Well, that shows exactly what's supposed to happen with us. If we truly have repentance, changing our mind and turning away from things, then we're going to walk in the way of the Word and we're going to be consistent doing it. It will be shown by fruit. People that say they repent, but they never bring forth fruit, have not shown forth true repentance. They've just given lip service. It's not going to do anything whatsoever. We come to verse 10. He says, Now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the tree. Cast into the fire, that is. The trees are. So because if we don't have the good fruit, which is shown by true repentance, we're going to be cast down and cast into the fire. We cannot have that. We must bring forth fruit. Fruit shows true repentance because you're now walking in the ways of the Lord. 
We see in Matthew 4, 17. At that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What were they to do? They were to change their mind and believe the gospel. He was bringing the gospel to them all. And then he, of course, went forth and did the mighty works of the Lord. Over in Mark's account, it's interesting what he says. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, verse 15, that's when Jesus began to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and he said, the time is fulfilled. What time was that? It was the time of when Messiah the Prince would come on the scene, which was Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, the 69 weeks, 26 AD, when Jesus now, that time was fulfilled. And Jesus now was going forth and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God's at hand, that means it's here, because this is a perfect tense verb, meaning that the action has been completed of this time fulfilled, and now the kingdom is here. Repent, he says, and believe the gospel. We should always believe the word of God, believe the gospel, believe the good news. And of course, this is what we, when we bring the gospel to other people, we want to see them repent, change their mind, and believe the gospel, and get born again, and start following the way of the Lord. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, are the ones who are walking in the ways of sin, sinful ones. This particular word that it talks about, this is an adjective, the word for sin, meaning one who is a sinful one. God calls those ones who are continually walking in sin to repentance. Now remember, as born-again Christians, we pointed out to you, we are not sinners any longer. We are dead to sin. Remember that we brought forth in Romans 6, verse 2, God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Where are we dead to sin? In spirit. Sin dwells in the flesh. We can sin from our body. We can sin from our soul, mind, will, or emotions. But our spirit is not sinning. We are now dead to sin, and we are not a sinner any longer. Remember what it says in verse 17. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin as a sinner. But you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine was delivered you, which was the gospel, and got born again. Being then made free from sin, which we are, you became servants of righteousness. We are not sinners any longer. We are now servants of righteousness. And he calls people, though, that are walking in sin continually to come to the place of repentance. We go back over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. He called the twelve, began to send them forth two by two, gave them authority. This means here, authority over unclean spirits. It's the word exousia that means authority. And so as they went forth to preach the gospel, verse 12, they cast out, or verse 12, sorry, says they went out and preached that men should repent, change their mind, and believe the gospel. Well, that was the first thing they needed to do. They needed to believe the gospel. Once they have repented, then they began to cast out many devils, anointed oil with many that were sick and healed them. People have to come to the Lord first, remember, and get born again. And they also need to deal with the areas of sin in their life for believers. You don't be casting demons out and ministering healing to people that are not right with God because they're going to get in worse shape. We see over in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 30. The scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick came not to call the righteous, but the sinners again to repentance. And they were the ones who were acting like they were religious people, but they weren't walking in the ways of the Lord. They needed to come to repentance. If we're not walking in the way of the Lord, we need repentance in our life. God doesn't wink at sin any longer. He expects every one of us to come to the place of repentance in our life. What's going to happen if we don't repent? Remember, God is a just God. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, he said, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 
talks about these sinners. He begins speaking to them again. Nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. God is only going to have the righteous with him, not the unrighteous, not the ungodly, not the lawless ones. They're all going to hear, depart from me, remember. We've talked about that. There must be a true repentance and change in our life. Now, repentance <coughs> is going to be shown in action. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 and following. In verse 28, he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented. He changed his mind, and he went. He came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. He didn't do what he said. Which of them twain did the will of his father? And said to him, The first. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, because they changed they, they were from what they originally were going to do. But what this, of course, shows is that true repentance is shown by action upon the word. Good intentions, what I will intend to do, what I say I'll do, but I don't carry it out, does not show repentance in our life. We can't just have the talk, we've got to have the walk. We've got to have the action. We must be carrying things out. True repentance is shown in action of doing the word or doing what you say you're going to do if you turn away from things. Now, we're going to look at a scripture at this point, highly misunderstood by the entire body of Christ. Acts 2.38. In Acts 2.38, there's been all kinds of teachings about this. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We need to understand what this verse says. Before we look at it, though, you must understand, verse 21, Peter had already said to them in preaching, verse 21, he says, It will come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's important when we see what we're going to be talking about. So they already knew what was expected of them to be saved. When we look at this, Peter said, repent, which means to change one's mind. And he said, be baptized. When we have the word repent, this is an imperative mood, meaning it's a command. Active voice, meaning they had to do this themselves. They were to change their mind. When it says be baptized, was that something that they were supposed to do themselves? No. The reason is because this is not an active voice. It was a command to them but it's a passive voice verb. The passive voice means someone else was, going to, else was going to do it to them, meaning they were going to be baptized by someone else. And you'll find that that is God, which we'll, you'll explain to you as we go. So he says, repent, repent, and you're going to be baptized, but it's a command to them, every one of you, then it says, in the name of Jesus Christ. There is tremendous error in the way that this has been translated. When we put the cursor over the word in, the normal word for in in the Greek is en that's translated in. This is not that. Instead, it is the, word, the Greek word epi, which normally is translated upon. This particular word, when you look at this also in the Greek, you find that epi is a word which, in this case, which we need to show you, it's used in the, what's called the dative case. This is epi. The reason we say dative case is because this is the article following it and then the word that it's talking about, which is the name. So, when it's, the dative, the epi can be used in different cases. It can be used in the genitive case, number one there, you see. It can be used in the accusative case, which is number three down there. But then when it's used in the dative case, it will be meaning because of or on the basis of, which you will see in this, which we'll point out for you in a moment. 
So what it's saying is repent and you're going to be baptized by someone else upon or on the basis of and because of the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it's saying. When the date of case is used, it's emphasizing position entered into. So what this is saying is you're to be baptized by someone else, each of you, because of the position that the name of Jesus Christ brought you into. That's what it's talking about. Because of the position that it brought you, because of or account of the name of Jesus. What did the name of Jesus bring you into? It brought you into salvation. This is talking about salvation. And again, remember what we pointed out to you in verse 21. He already told them, the one who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so this is why they, after when they got pricked in their heart, they said, what shall we do to be saved? They were thinking about that, what he had told them to do. And now he's telling them what they do in order to be saved. They're going to change their mind. They're going to be baptized by someone else, which is God, because of and on account of the name of Jesus Christ, which they were going to call upon, which produces salvation. Then it comes down to, it says, for the remission of sins. That doesn't mean talking about them getting rid of their own personal sins, just confessing them or whatever, or, the, or that baptism was going to wash away their own personal sins. It's not talking about that. Because this particular word is not the word for, it's the word ice, which is translated into. Normally, you see it 573 times is what it's talking about. And when we talk about into the remission Remission is a word which means the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins. It's not talking about getting rid of your personal sins you've committed. It's talking about the release from the bondage or imprisonment of sins. When was man in bondage or imprisonment to sin? Before he was born again. What happened after he got born again? He's not imprisoned and in bondage to sin any longer because he's dead to sin. He's brand new on the inside of him. So this is talking about becoming baptized, which results bringing him into this, into the place of the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins. That happens when you're born again. This is talking about the new birth say, what about this baptism? It's a spiritual baptism that God performs in a person's life. Well, I'll come back to this in a moment. Most people in the entire body of Christ, and if you've been here for a while, you've heard me talk about it, but if you haven't, you may not have heard me. They don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. It is not an experience that occurs after you're born again. Look what it says. For by one spirit, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we are baptized into one body. When did we come into the body? When we got born again. This is by the spirit, being baptized by the spirit that brought us into the body of Christ. What does baptism mean? It means to immerse. You and I are immersed and submerged in the presence of the Holy Spirit when we received Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And what happened? He took the old spirit out and put the new spirit in. It happened through the immersing of the presence of the Holy Spirit when we received Jesus. He brought, this, brought us into the body. That scripturally is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not some experience that occurs after we're born again. That teaching has not been understood and has caused tremendous error in the body of Christ. Now, going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. See, people have thought this is talking about water baptism. But it's not talking about you being baptized with water because it's talking about being baptized on account of or because of the name of Jesus Christ. You've been calling on the name of the Lord. And furthermore, it's because it's passive voice. It means it's not you actively 
doing something. It's God doing something to you instead. This is the baptism by the Holy Spirit because of, of an account of the name of Jesus Christ into the release from bondage or imprisonment to sins. <laughs> You're not in bondage or prison to sins any longer. And that is important to understand. Let me just make a comment also. The word remission is different, this is the word aphesis, is different from the word for forgiveness of sins for like a Christian. Let me show you this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. When it talks about confessing our sins, you know, we're going to confess our sins. It talks about forgiving. This is the Greek word, aphiomi. All right? That is the word that refers to where we are personally confessing our sins. We come to verse 38. This is not the word aphiomi. It is a different word. It is the word aphesis. The word aphesis means release from bondage and imprisonment, while the word aphiomi is referring to the sending away of the sins of a person personally. And when you do a study, which I've done on all the words of aphesis and all the words of aphiomi, you see this clearly shown. Let me just show you a couple of these. Acts 26, verse 18, so you understand this. The gospel comes to a person to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan unto God, that they may receive. And when you come to the authority of Satan to God, that's when you get born again, right? And you come out of darkness to light when you get born again. That they may receive not forgiveness, but the release from bondage or imprisonment, which is aphesis. Because you're, that's not talking about personal sins. This is talking about you coming out from under the, bond, the, the bondage or imprisonment of sin, which is what everybody was in before they were born again. And notice, not only does he receive the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins, but also inheritance. When do we come into the place of being an heir? When we get born again, right? This isn't talking about you getting rid of personal sins. This is talking about you coming out of the bondage to sin. So, this is one scripture. There's another one. In all the scriptures, when you look at them, using Ephesus is talking about release from bondage, imprisonment, and it's talking about salvation that comes when we get born again. Luke 1, 77, to give the knowledge of salvation that's when we get born again, right? Unto his people by the release from bondage or imprisonment of their sins. That's what happens when we get born again. We come out from it. We're not in bondage to it any longer whatsoever. Matthew 26, verse 28. This is the blood of my New Testament. Now, when do we come into the New Testament? And we get born again, right? Which is shed for many into, not for, into ice, the release from bondage or imprisonment of sins. And what the blood of Jesus do? It's what ratified the New Testament. And what happens? It brought us into a relationship with him when we get born again and saved. We come into the New Testament. You see, Ephesus is talking about what happens at salvation you release from the bondage and prism of sins. A me is talking about the personal sins being forgiven. Unfortunately, the King James has just translated things all over the place, which is just crazy. So it's why it's been very difficult for people to understand this. Now let's go back for a moment here again to Acts 2.38. And if you, I'm sure you've never heard this, <laughs> because hardly anybody has taught anything correct about this because they haven't corrected all the errors that we see. He says, repent, be baptized by somebody else. Each of you, he's talking to the people, remember, they said, what do we do? They were, you know, they, they wanted to get saved. 
because of or on account of the name of Jesus Christ into the release from bondage or imprisonment. How do we come to the release and the bondage imprisonment? We call on the name of the Lord. We get saved. We receive Jesus. This is talking about new birth, being born again. It's not talking about water baptism. By the way, if this was talking about water baptism, and this was talking about the so-called uh, your sins being forgiven, remission if you think it's forgiven, does water baptism get rid of our sins? No, not at all. That's a contradiction in the scripture. First Peter chapter 3 makes it clear. It talks about baptism, water baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It doesn't get rid of sins. Water baptism doesn't do that. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God of what happened on the inside of you. Furthermore, I'll show you another one. This is, denominations have made great mistakes about this. They also have said, they thought, well, you're supposed to be baptized with water, they think. And they think it's supposed to be in the name of Jesus, the oneness people all believe this, in error, for the remission of your sins, thinking that this is going to get rid of all your sins, and it doesn't have anything to do with that whatsoever. And then they think, you have to have that done, so then you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's their teaching. It's all lies. It's not true. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about salvation. Repent, be baptized by God, because of an account of the name of Jesus Christ that you called upon, into the release from bondage, imprisonment, sins. You're not under it anymore. You're free from it because now you're born again. Now that you're born again, what does that do? That puts you in a position now that you can receive the Holy Spirit, right? That's why it says next, and you shall take hold of, Lombano, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can you take hold of the gift of the Holy Ghost before you're born again? No. This is talking about being born again. No, no, you got to be baptized with water if you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. That's what they say. Well, that's not true. How do we know that? Oh, here's a good example of why that's so. You can receive the Holy Spirit before you're baptized with water. Acts chapter 10. Here's where Peter goes and speaks words. The Holy Ghost fell on them as they heard the word. They got born again, and that was actually the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In fact, let me show you that. Luke 11, Acts 11, verse 14 to 16, he said, I'm going to tell you words whereby you and all your house are going to be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on the beginning. That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, he said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. That was the presence of God when they received Jesus and they got a brand new spirit. They got born again. As I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened as he was speaking the words for them to be saved. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is what produces salvation when you've received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And going back to what we were commenting on, so he speaks the words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they got born again. Then it says, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Also, meaning the Holy Spirit came into them after that. First they were baptized of the Holy Spirit. That's what that is, the Holy Ghost falling upon them. The second thing is they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Had these guys been baptized of water yet? No. They heard them speak with tongues. Can you speak with tongues before you're baptized with water? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't have anything to do with it. And magnify God. And then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized but to receive the Holy Ghost as well as we? They already received the Holy Spirit. So does the water baptism have anything to do with receiving the Holy Spirit? No. That destroys an entire denomination's teachings. It's all lies. Thinking you have to be baptized with water in order to receive the Holy Spirit. It's not true. 
It's all because of this verse. This is their big verse, Acts 2.38. They'll always tell you, Acts 2.38. Sure, it's fine, Acts 2.38. They, they don't understand what it means. Repent and each of you be baptized by God on account of and because of the name of Jesus Christ that you called upon to get born again into the release from bondage or imprisoned to sins. Praise God, we're born again. I'm not under that any longer. Now I'm, a, I'm in covenant relationship with God. And you shall, after that, take hold of Lombano, the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what it's saying. Thought I would share that with you. You need to know the truth about this so you can be ready to share that with other people. They, they, you have to point out all the errors. You have to point out what, the, what in me, it really means. It's epi, and you have to show it's a dative case. You have to know these things and what it means because of our account. This is all critical. This is why we got to know the Greek. And this is why we have to look up all these words. You can't think. They, they make the big thing in the name of Jesus. And it doesn't even mean in. <laughs> it means on the counter because of the name of Jesus. That destroys their doctrine because they're big on that. It's very sad that the people have got to that place, but that's, that's what happens. Well, I thought I would share that one with you. I trust that's helped you. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted. If we repent, we're going to be converted, turned around. That your sins may be blotted out. Oh, does that mean they're automatically blotted out? Passive voice, to be blotted out, there's what it would be. Your sins, to be blotted out, it's an infinitive. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Otherwise, you get converted, and then your sins can be washed away. And you're commanded to repent, and you're commanded to be converted. So that also tells you that you've got to come and get converted first, get born again, get right, so that your sins to be blotted out or washed away. That's talking about your personal sins that you're dealing with. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God. Then hath God also to the Gentiles, Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Repentance is necessary for us to come to life, having eternal life. And God expects us now to deal with all sin areas as a believer. Acts 17.30 says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. We cannot be walking in unrighteousness and think that we won't be judged. We're kidding ourselves. We've got to turn from all of it, and we've got to have a true repentance in our life and turn away from it. This repentance is going to be shown by turning to God and showing, walking in His ways. Acts 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you show faith toward Him? When you start hearing and doing the Word and walking in His ways, speaking the Word, doing the Word, walking in His ways. In Acts 26, we see something else in verse 20. He showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works, meet, or be fitting of repentance. Remember we saw that we had to have fruit for repentance. Well, this also is in line with that, works for repentance. Because what happens? As you work in the Word, it will produce fruit in your life, won't it? We've got to have fruit, and we've got to have the works. Otherwise, talk doesn't do it. Works are action, isn't it? Carrying it out. If you really have repentance in your life, let's say I repent from, you know, um, being angry. Well, you're not going to be angry anymore. I repent from bitterness, I'm not going to have bitterness anymore. I'm not going to have fruit from walking in the way of the Word. And I'm going to have the works of doing what God wants me to do, and I'm not going to yield to those things any longer. Fruit and works. Without fruit and without the works, there's no true repentance. It's just a bunch of lip service. Romans chapter 2. 
You see, if you've been saying, I repent, and then you keep on doing the same thing over and over, there's a problem. It shouldn't be happening. We have good, I have good intentions. Well, that's, that's at least you, got your, your, you have good intentions. I mean, that's a start. But there needs to be some action and some fruit. And there needs to be true repentance shown. Romans 2, 4. O despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Of course, why would that be? Because God doesn't want us to be judged. <laughs> In fact, he goes on and says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. These, if they wouldn't repent. Repentance from sin, so we see the goodness of God, the mercy of God come to us, and we won't be judged. Now another thing. If you have gifts and callings of God that you have walked away from, well, God still sees them with you. Romans 11 and 29, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. Whatever he's called you to, whatever gifts he's given you, they're without repentance. He's expecting you to carry those out in your life and do them. Now, if we're going to have true repentance, we really need to come to the place of meeting the conditions that are necessary. We go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And he wrote to them to bring them to repentance. He says, though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. See, they got kind of mad and upset about it and hurt, damaged, because they didn't handle it the right way. Though I did repent, for I perceived the same epistle made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed, but that you sorrowed to repentance. They finally came to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. What this is essentially saying is, if you go to correct somebody, and they don't receive it properly, they will have a negative attitude against you. They might be mad about it. <laughs> they might think you're judging me or whatever it might be. They're going to receive damage because they didn't receive it correctly and they're going to end up being damaged because they didn't receive the Word of God. But if you sorrow to a, tr well, a godly sorrow, to repentance, there won't be any damage by us. What this is saying is it's possible for you to, that someone could be damaged not your fault, it's their fault for not receiving the word. How about the people that go and tell you and, and they, get, they get mad and upset? You're judging me. Or maybe they throw stones back in your face. Yeah, you did this and such and such, you know. <laughs> they, got, they got damaged because they didn't receive the word of God and, and handle it properly with a godly sorrow before God. Well, they were mad about what you said, see, and that's wrong. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented. But the sorrow of the world, which is them getting mad about it and upset, or maybe they got caught and they're upset about it, it works death. The only sorrow, the only repentance that works is a godly sorrow before God. Otherwise, I'm sorrow, my sorrow is before God. Not that I got caught in something, you know. If we just got caught in something, and we're sorry because of that, there hasn't been any godly sorrow. It's got to be a sorrow before God. That brings true repentance. Now, what is the marks or the qualities that are going to show true repentance? There's eight things that are listed here, and they're very important. For behold the self-same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And if you sorrowed after a godly sort, what should it produce in you? What is really going to show there's real repentance? The first one, where it says what careful, carefulness it wrought in you. This is the Greek word spude, which means diligence. What diligence it caused, or earnestness, diligence, to get something done with haste. Otherwise, you're going to deal with this thing. You're not going to just let it slide. You're not going to be slothful. You're not going to sweep it under the rug. You're not going to kind of just let it go. No. It's going to work diligence in you. It's going to work in you, accomplish, 
to deal with a situation. I'm going to deal with this thing right now. I'm not going to sweep it under the rug. I'm not going to let it slide by. I'm going to deal with this. So that's one thing. The second thing is, what clearing of yourselves? That means i got to clear myself in this matter somehow. Well, what does that mean I'm going to do? I'm going to do what is necessary to clear myself before God. That would involve confessing the sin, having a true change of mind and repentance, taking a stand against it so I'm not going to yield to that any longer in my life. I'm going to make sure I'm going to clear myself before God with this thing because I'm going to have a true godly sorrow that re shows repentance. What indignation? This means uh, a strong indignation or irritation. I mean, you're going to be upset about it. You should have an upset, be upset about it. A hatred and an anger and irritation that you gave place to this sin. Otherwise, you just don't say, well, you know, we're always going to sin kind of attitude. No. You should have a real attitude against it. It is not a light thing to walk in sin. Remember, like Ahab, he thought it was a light thing, thing, not a big deal. It is a big deal. You should have a hatred of sin. Remember, Jesus hates lawlessness, and lawlessness is a sin. You should hate it. It should really get after you in indignation, irritate you, make you upset that you got this, this thing got a hold of you. You need to get that kind of an attitude against you're going to deal with it. You're not going to get place this again. What fear? This is the talk about the fear of the Lord. Because you know, if you walk in sin, judgments are coming your way. <laughs> I, don't, I got the fear of the Lord because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to have all kinds of calamities and destruction and bad things are going to be coming upon me because God's just. You know, what a man sows, he's going to reap. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you reap life everlasting. You're going you're to be reaping it. Then, what vehement desire or longing, longing to do what is right and make sure I don't sin again. I don't give place to this thing again. There should be a longing, a strong desire on your behalf. And what zeal, you're zealous, goes right along with that. You have a zeal, you're zeal, zealous. You're zealous to do what's right. I'm going to make sure this thing gets put underfoot in my life. So you're going to, if you're going to do that, you're going to get the word in you. I know I've got to get the word in me, so I'm going to not give place to this. I'm going to be ready to speak the word, resist the temptations, and keep the word before me, and think correctly, and make right choices. And what revenge? This is a revenge against who? The devil. I'm going to take it to the devil who he got me into this. He, I gave place to him. Nonetheless, the devil has made some inroads in my life. I'm going to take it to the devil. You're going to cast out those demons. You're going to be ready to resist the devil with the word of God. You're going to get after this thing. You are not going to let this happen again. You know demons have come into you. So you know you've got to start casting them out to get rid of them. And if it's been an ongoing problem, you know you've got quite a network, and you're going to have to really get busy on working on this. Otherwise, you're going to be diligent. You're going to clear yourself. You're going to have a real indignation against it. You're going to have the fear of the Lord knowing what's going to happen if you don't deal with it. You're going to have a strong, longing desire, a zeal, and a revenge against the enemy. I'm going to deal with this. And you have to know, if you don't deal with it, well, it's going to happen again. If the devil knows your weak points, <laughs> he'll exploit them. He nailed you once, he'll nail you again. It gets easier and easier to do it, and he'll get stronger and stronger. He'll come on you a little bit, then he'll come on stronger and then stronger. He's not going to back off. Anybody knows your weak points, you're going to exploit him. <laughs> He's going to come after you. It means you've got to get after him. You cannot allow this to continue. This is the marks, the eight things that you must do. If you will do this, you'll conquer everything that comes against you. If you take it a light attitude about sin, or you just kind of, yeah, I'll try my best, or, or you, know, I'm, you know, everybody sins, you know, and you're going to make excuses, you know, if everybody has this problem. Anything contrary to the truth, you're, gonna, you're, just, you're going nowhere. You're going to be in trouble. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. He came after these guys because they kept sinning. You know, first letter, second letter, these guys were full of sexual sin and all kinds of problems in Corinth. 
He said in 1220, he says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as I would not, lest there be debates. There are not supposed to be debates. Envyings, strife, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. And fear, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many of you which have sinned already and have not repented. Now, you guys didn't stop this. Of the uncleanness and the fornication and the lasciviousness which they've committed. They went on and had their debates about all these things. We don't do that. That's all. It's sin. It's wrong. They never repented of it. They never got right before it. We have to get right. In fact, he even says, look what he says in verse chapter 13, verse 1. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses will every word be established. I told you before and foretell you of our presence the second time being absent now I write to them which herefore of sin and to all the others if I come again I will not spare. He's going to be tough. I'm not going to let this thing go along. He says, since you seek a proof of Christ being me, to which to, to you word it's not weak, but it's mighty in you. He's going to come after him. He's going to examine themselves, and they're going to have to deal with themselves. So he's, tell, he's telling them, I'm going to come after you. Well, we need to make sure God doesn't send people after us because we haven't repented. And say, hey, well, let's get, get with the program here. That's the third time I've had to come and tell you. How many times do we have to be told? <laughs> we should be on top of it immediately, repenting before the Lord. Now, 2 Timothy tells us another important thing, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Verse 20, chap, chapter 2, verse 24. 2 Timothy 2, 24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive. You don't get in strife with people, but you be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient or forbearing. We're bringing the truth to them to help them. In meekness, not condescending, putting them down, browbeating them. No, that's not the way you approach people. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Who are the guys that oppose themselves? The guy that's walking in sin. He's against himself, whether he realize, he's a born-again Christian, and yet he's against himself because he's walking in sin, giving place to the devil. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance... Two, not acknowledging as a participle, it's a noun instead, and it means precise, correct knowledge. That you come to the precise, correct, here it is, it's a noun. It's not a participle. Why they translate it, I don't know. To the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. So what's the person do, need to do? They need to come in line with the truth. Everybody's got to come in line with the truth to repent. That's why you give them the word. You don't give them your opinion. You don't tell them what your piece of, give them a piece of mind or tell them what you think. You give them the word so they can come to repentance to the truth, see? And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him, the devil, at his will, at the devil's will. So as you instruct them, also, then they're going to say, pray for me to get the devil off of me. Sorry, you got to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. You're going to have to pray for yourself. You're going to have to start casting out yourself. You can pray in agreement with them, but they have to be involved in it. So many people want to get the devil off of me. You know, I've confessed my sin. I've repented. Just get, get this thing off of me. Sorry. You get to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil who took you captive. you got to turn the tables on him and take it to him and drive him out. Because if you don't do it, he'll get, someone else gets them off. Are you strong enough? Have you really dealt with the thing? Have you really brought the vengeance against the enemy? No. I just want somebody else to get this pain or this problem off of me. Doesn't work that way. You let the enemy in, you get to drive the enemy out. You get to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. Now, we're going to address another subject. Lots of things that are... There's another one. Hebrews 6, verse 4. 
It is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the powers or the, author, the power, yes, powers of the age to come, if they shall fall away, it says in the King James, to renew them again to repentance, they can't come to repentance. Seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put them to an open shame. That means, here's a case where someone can't come to repentance from God's standpoint. Why? It says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, that meant they came to the light, that means they got born again. Came to, they heard the word, that's what it means. And they tasted the heavenly gift, that's being born again. So they got the light, they heard, they got revelation of the word, they came and got born again. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost as they received the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of God, the spoken word of God. They've been seeing the word of God working in their life. These guys have grown up. And the powers of the age to come, they've been operating in the power of God. This is talking about someone who's born again, has the Holy Spirit, he's grown up, he's seen the Word working, he's seen all these things happen and the power of God work in his life, he's grown up some level of maturity. He's seen God do a great work in him. And you're going to turn around and throw that away? It's not if they shall fall away, it's a mistake. Because when you look at this, this is a participle in the aorist tense meaning literally having fallen away. They already have fallen away. It's talking about a statement where the guy has fallen away. And when we talk about has fallen away, when you look at this, this means that they have turned away from the Lord. They're not walking in His ways anymore. They must be walking in lawlessness or unrighteousness or something. Having seen this work of God to the point where you come to some level of maturity and you have fallen away, he says you can't renew them again into repentance. Why? Because they're crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh and they're putting them in open shame. God did this great work in you and everybody sees it and then you threw it out the window. You don't do that to God. He's not going to put up with that. That's essentially what this is saying. This is not talking about a nominal Christian. This is talking about someone that's coming to a level of maturity. You put them to open shame or to a public, this really means to make a public example or expose to public disgrace. God doesn't come and do a work in someone to raise them up and become uh, to a level and then all of a sudden they throw it away and now they're walking on all this evil stuff and think that they're going to have a chance to repentance. No. The Bible says, nope, it's not going to happen. It's quite a statement. God doesn't do the work in you and then you can just go do what you want. He that bears thorns and briars is rejected is nigh to cursing whose ends to be burned. That's where they're going to come to. Let's look at another one. Hebrews 12, here it's talking about we've got to make straight paths for our feet. And we can't be like someone like a fornicator, he's in trouble, or a profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. The birthright is threw it away. Now that birthright was the right to all the blessings. He threw it away. Then it comes to verse 17. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, I, all he wants, I want the blessing now, he was rejected. Why? Because he found no place of repentance, true repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Why was that? Remember, he lied. If you remember back in Genesis, in fact, we'll show you. Genesis chapter 27 in verse 34 when Jesus Esau heard the words of his father he cried with a grout a great and exceeding bitter cry and said to his father bless me even me also my father he wanted to be blessed so thy brother came with subtlety and taken away thy blessing 
And he, sa he says, he's supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Did he take away the birthright? No. Esau sold it to him. He was a liar. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Not so. The blessing was the right of the person who had the birthright. So he was a liar. So did he find true repentance? No, he didn't come and say, hey, I sold the birthright and I made a mistake. This guy, you know, was deceiving me or whatever. Hast thou now reserved? Now he's taken away my blessing. He was a liar. That's why there was no repentance. Otherwise, if you don't come to the truth, there's no repentance. He did not have any repentance before God. He sought it with tears. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Wasn't going to work. You have to have true repentance in our life. And that's so important. At the same time, you've got to know that God, even though judgments will come, He doesn't want people to be judged. 2 Peter 3, 9, God, Lord's long-suffering concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. He's long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to come to repentance. Now, before we conclude, we want to look at the judgment that's coming on the church. Because the judgment comes to the church before it comes to the world, remember. And look what he says in Revelation 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. The first love, which is Jesus and the walking in line with the word of God, they weren't doing that anymore. They had a second love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, you turned away from, and repent, and do the first works. Otherwise, your works will show whether you have really repented. People that say they repent and they're not doing the things that the first works, they haven't really repented. Well, I'm not doing the bad thing anymore. Well, it's got to be more than not doing the bad thing anymore. You've got to return to where you were. The first works. That's what he's saying. You can't sit back in whatever state I want to be in. Do the first works. Otherwise, if you really say you repent, you'll come back to where you were at one point in time. That's what he's saying. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. That means the light's going to leave you <laughs> out of his place except thou repent. That's a judgment that's going to come. This is the ones that maybe even say they stopped sinning, but they haven't returned back to where they really were once at, in a place doing the first works. They're just trying to hold God at bay. And they're, not, they're not really coming in line because real repentance means you come back in line with the word of God and you walk in line with it. We come over to verse 16. Repent, or else I'll come unto thee quickly and fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. He's talking about those that had the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Remember the doctrine of the Nicolaitans where they thought they could just do anything and still be saved. We got that today. The once saved, always saved teaching. It was it's false. We covered that in the past. Totally wrong. They thought they could just do whatever they wanted to do. Of course, the other guys, they were sacrificing to idols. We see this also down here in verse 21, dealing with the Jezebel. In verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast sufferest the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, eat things, sacrifice to idols. If you remember, we talked about this in the past, but this is Thyatira, where the place was just trade unions, and unless you belonged to the trade union, you couldn't get a job. Well, the trade unions, they had idolatry, they had fornication, they had orgies and all kinds of crazy things going on. And if you ha became, got a job as a trade union, you had to come in line with everything they did. You had to come and eat f food that was sacrificed to idols, you had to get involved in the idolatry, you had to get involved and participate in the fornicating orgies and all these kind of things. So, oh, this is Jezebel, called herself a prophetess, she was teaching the church, well, you it's okay to go ahead and do these things because you've got to have a job so you'll have money, so you'll, you know. No, it's not okay to do these things. Teaching, seducing that they could do these things, that was wrong. That's compromise. You cannot compromise the word. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. 
That tells you something. God will always give us space to repent. He's not uh, ready to you know, beat somebody over the head. He's always calling us to repentance. And he gives us space to repent. But what happens? Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. What else does this tell you? As I pointed before, this tells you that the judgment that's coming on the church is right prior to the beginning of the great tribulation. Because what happens if they, their the judgment is, they're going to be cast into the great tribulation, which means it hadn't happened yet, but it's happening then at that point in time. So the judgment's going to come on the church at the end of this, remember, in this ne at the end of this next per period of time leading up to 2030, which is the end of the church age. And then whoever hadn't passed the test, they are going to be cast in the great tribulation and they are going to be in trouble. And I will kill her children, that's all her followers, with death and all the churches shall know. Well, I thought they said the church is going to be gone. No, they're going to be here. How are the churches going to know? Because they're going to see it. They're going to see them cast into the great tribulation. Well, I guess they're still here. That's right. The pre-trib raptures can't, they, can, they don't have anything to say about that. That kind of, well, that doesn't quite compute with what we believed. Because <laughs> they're wrong. I am he which searches the brains and the hearts, and I'll give unto the everyone according to your works. Chapter 3, verse 1. He said, I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Oh, that's the Christian in name only. I say I'm a Christian. Where's your works? Uh, they're not around, are they? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. A whole lot of stuff has died out, and everything else is about ready to die out. For I have not found your works not perfect, it's a mistake. It's the word which means to be filled up or fulfilled. Filled up, or as he brings it, fulfilled. I have not found your works fulfilled before God. What's that mean? Our works are to be fulfilled before God, of working out our own salvation. They hadn't been doing anything. What's going to happen to the people that haven't worked out their own salvation and their works are not fulfilled before God? They're a Christian in name only. They haven't been doing the word. They're in trouble. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou wilt shall not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I'm going to come upon thee. And then he says, I have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Sardis was a messed up place. There was only a few that were walking right. They shall walk with me in white, they are worthy. And he that conquers and overcomes carries off the victory. He'll say him to be clothed with white raiment, righteousness, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Who are the guy that's, that's going to be clothed with white raiment and righteous? The guy who hasn't defiled himself. He hasn't defiled his garments. What's going to happen to the guys, though, the Christian in name only, that have their works haven't been fulfilled and they're still walking in sin? Their name's going to be blotted out. They're in trouble. Revelation 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Who's he talking to? church at Laodicea. Remember, these are the guys that they weren't cold and they weren't hot. They were lukewarm because they were all focused on walking in the flesh and they were focused on just doing whatever they could do in this life. They only cared about this life. They were living after crap to this life. Increased, rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. He says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. <laughs> they didn't have the spiritual things of God in their life whatsoever. And he told them what they needed to do. And then he tells them that they need to be zealous and repent. In fact, these guys were so far away, God was on the outside. I stand at the door and knock, wanting to come in, the door of your heart. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and sup with him and he with me. If they don't, they're in trouble. God expects every one of us to walk in his ways and do what needs to be done. There must be true repentance in our life. True repentance is shown by a change of mind, change in our heart. It'll be shown by fruit. It'll be shown by 
our works. It will shown, be shown by our godly sorrow and those eight things that we talked about that are, you're going to do to conquer all these areas in your life. It will be shown by you doing the word and being ready to conquer the enemy in all areas. You're going to be ready, quick to repent, ready to repent. You're not going to just wallow in the problem. You're not going to make excuses. You're not going to have compromise. You know, you're not going to be just doing what the things you want to do. You're going to be doing the first works. You're going to be getting things right and making sure you're doing what's right before God. You're going, your works are going to be fulfilled before God. You're going to be walking in holiness and righteousness before Him and not letting your garments be defiled. Look at all these things that we've talked about. That is what God wants. And we're going to recover ourselves out of the snare of the devil. We must have true repentance. True repentance. And we'll close with the last verse that we have talked about before, but we need to talk about it again. If we confess our sins, there's, we're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Great mistake, the way this is translated. To forgive is not an infinitive in the Greek. To cleanse is not an infinitive in the Greek, even though it looks like it's been, it's been translated as infinitive in English. It's wrong. There's three subjunctive mood verbs. This is the first one. The subjunctive mood in the Greek is a conditional statement upon conditions being met to see it come to pass. If we confess, there's all the scriptures where it says, if such and such, well, that's going to be in the subjunctive mood because that's a conditional statement. If I do such and such, if we confess our sins, so we would know that that would be one. He is faithful and just, not an infinitive, but again, a subjunctive mood verb, that he might forgive us our sins if we meet the conditions, which is true repentance, a godly sorrow, and overcoming that thing in our life. And to cleanse us, again, a subjunctive mood that we may, he may cleanse us, it's not automatic, from every unrighteousness. Well, how do we get cleansed from all unrighteousness? We talked about it. This scripture really kind of sums it up when it says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Well, that means that it's our job to do it since it's a conditional statement, subjunctive mood again. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, defilement of the flesh. Every fleshly work's got to be put out, eliminated. Eliminated from your life. And the filthiness of the spirit, not talking about your spirit, there's no filthiness in your spirit. All the filthiness of the spirit are all the demons that are in you that have to be cast out. The result, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's what God is going to bring every one of us to. Therefore, if we really have true repentance in our life, not only we can confess our sins, but we're going to do what's necessary to, so he will forgive us our sins. It's not automatic. We're going to have a true godly sorrow that works repentance, and we're going to conquer this thing and overcome it. We're going to have fruit. We're going to have works. We're going to come to the first works. We're going to be doing the Word of God. We are not going to let this thing get a hold of us. We have a godly sorrow that works repentance. We are diligent. We are zealous. We are going forth to conquer these enemies and get rid of them and never let this happen again. And we're going to get cleansed from all the unrighteousness. We're going to cast out all the demons and put these things away and not give place to them. And we're going to come to the place of perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is what God wants for every single one. And that's what he'll do in your life if you just do what he says. Remember, God does the work, but we have a part to play by doing what he says. Certainly, repentance is mandatory in our life. Say this, Heavenly Father. I thank you for understanding true repentance, which means to change the mind, including a change of heart, with a change of action, evidenced by fruit and by works, and with a godly sorrow that works true repentance, that I do what's necessary with diligence to clear myself, to conquer the enemies, 
with a strong lining, longing and zealous desire to conquer this enemy and see this sin be eliminated and put underfoot. I thank you. My works will be fulfilled because I'm working out my own salvation and I am conquering all sins. I thank you that as I have the works, I have the fruit, I have the change of mind, and I'm doing what God says. I'm doing the first works. I've shown that I've really been restored back to walking in the ways of the Lord, evidenced by what I do. I thank you. I will not sweep under the rug or ignore problems in my life. I won't compromise. I won't make excuses. I won't have good intentions and then not get it done. I will make sure every area of sin that's not of God will be eliminated. I will have a true godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation, to deliverance, to being healed and set free. I thank you, Lord, that as I have a godly sorrow and I show true repentance, then I will be forgiven. I will be cleansed from all unrighteousness and I will come to the place of perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Thank you for performing your word in my life as I do what the word says. And I understand I have to recover myself out of the snare of the devil as I do what the word says. God's not going to get me out of it without my participation. And I'm not going to get somebody else to pray my problem away. I have to recover myself by doing the word, putting off the works of the flesh, casting out the demons, walking in line with the word, and not giving place to the devil again. I thank you that I will have true repentance evidenced in my life by the fruit and the works. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you that we understand true repentance and we won't ever be any of those ones that say I repent and then no works, no fruit, no evidence of it. We will be doers of your word and we will meet those eight conditions in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, 11 showing what is necessary to overcome and clear ourselves. Thank you, Father, for true results from this word of true repentance that we eliminate everything that is not of you in our life and that we truly come to the place of perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name. Amen.